Welcome to Module 3. Throughout this module, we're going to be discussing ways that astronomers are able to study distant objects, including objects that we'll never get a chance to go visit. We're going to start with these first two videos talking about sections of the textbook in Chapter 3, and then we'll be moving on to Chapters 5 and 6 later in the module. Let's get started. So we left off our historical discussion of the history of astronomy with Galileo. Now all of the dates on this slide you don't have to write down. I just want to have them so that we have a sense of what's happening concurrently in time uh, because we are actually jumping in at a different location in Europe but at roughly the same time frame. Tycho Brahe was a Danish nobleman who was very well known for his precise measurements of the locations of the planets and um, mapping of the stars. Now, if we look at his entire lifespan, we see that he died before the telescope was ever invented. So he is extremely well known as an astronomer. He was given funds by the Danish king when he discovered a supernova that he incorrectly thought was a new star. Um, but he's doing all of this through careful measurements of angles, altitude, and azimuth, rather than um, detailed telescope observations. What we also see is that Galileo and Kepler, Johannes Kepler, lived at the same time um, as each other. And in fact, Galileo bookended both ends of Kepler's life, and they exchanged, exchanged a number of letters with each other. So our discussion today focuses on Kepler's understanding of the data that Tycho Brahe was taking. Now, Tycho Brahe was very, um, very opinionated and had a very strong, perhaps negative, personality. And although he hired Johannes Kepler to help him with mathematical uh, analysis, he kept all of his data very close to his chest, uh, worrying that someone would take his fame. It was only after he died that Kepler really got the uh, ability to go through all of this wealth of data, locations of planets from one night to the next, and how they moved against the background stars, so that he could do a much larger analysis of what is happening with planets throughout their orbit. He created three laws of planetary motion that we want to make sure that we can understand. Now, if we remember back to section 1.2, when we went from the geocentric model of Ptolemy in ancient Greece to Copernicus's heliocentric model, we had talked about this idea of epicycles, circles on circles, in order to get the planets to be where they needed to be without giving up on the idea of the perfect circle. One of the big things that we have to recognize right at the start that Kepler um, originally was trying to keep and then realized just was not going to work is that the planets do not orbit in perfect circles. It's really close, which is why it took thousands of years to fix it, um, but Kepler realized that instead they orbit in ellipses. Now, an ellipse is a specific type of shape that we want to get used to before we talk about Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. So here on the left, we have a uh, diagram of an ellipse with several different labels. And on the right, we see an example of if we were to take a piece of paper and put two pins in it and string some uh, string through the pins so that we were carving out a location based on that string loop, we would get an ellipse. Now let's discuss these different terms and what they mean. The pins in the pin board, or F1 and F2 in the diagram on the left, are the focus points. So more than one focus, the plural is foci, so we do want to be able to recognize that. So an ellipse has two foci instead of one single important center. Certainly the center is labeled both in red on the right and with the word center on the left, but it is not the most relevant uh, piece to the shape in the same way that the center of a circle is extremely relevant. The two focus points are more important. Then there is a description in the bottom left of the uh, left diagram, semi-major axis, lowercase letter a. The semi-major axis is a way to describe the radius, almost, of an ellipse, where when we think about a circle, the radius is from the center to the edge, 
and it's the same for a circle all the way around. And if we were to double that, we'd be talking about the diameter of a circle. For an ellipse, there's not one single diameter and there's not one single radius. Instead, there's a major axis and a minor axis. Now that major axis is the one that astronomy uses most often. It's more relevant to the way that we um, can understand what planets are doing. And it is from the center to the edge along that longest uh, axis, which has to run through both focus points. And then there is this term eccentricity. The eccentricity of a, an ellipse tells us how close to being a circle it is or how broken from being a circle it is. An eccentricity of zero means a perfect circle and eccentricity, an eccentricity of one is as far from a circle as you can possibly get. It is a sliding scale from zero to one. So when we think about uh, these different terms, we want to be able to compare them to uh, circles. So focus points are kind of like the center of a circle, but they're different. The semi-major axis is kind of like the radius of a circle, but slightly different. And an eccentricity is telling us how far away we are from being a perfect circle. So Kepler's first law states that each planet moves around the sun in an orbit that is an ellipse with the sun at one focus of the ellipse. Now this diagram I found to be really helpful for us to realize that with those really stretched out diagrams like the previous slide and we're going to see coming up, we get the incorrect assumption that the planets are so far from being circles, like how could we possibly have kept this in these models for thousands of years? The planet orbits are very close to being perfect circles. In gray, we have circle shapes, and in orange on this slide, we have an ellipse. And there's two points that are almost right next to each other near the center of that circle and ellipse. One is the focus where the sun actually is, and the second is the other focus um, symmetrically on the opposite side of the true center. So it is hard for us to see the difference. And you'll note that perihelion and aphelion are noted here where perihelion is happening in January, a fun fact that we learned back when we talked about the calendar and seasons. That's the closest point we get to the sun, and aphelion, the farthest away we get from the sun, is happening in July. So, Kepler's first law, the important thing is that he threw out circles, it's ellipses instead, but nearly circular ellipses. Kepler's second law is very mathy. The straight line joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas in space in equal intervals of time. Before I rephrase it, you can certainly read this slide if you want to, before I rephrase it, let's look at the diagram from our textbook. From point one to point two, let's say that that's a, um, the orbit of a comet and that from point one to point two takes a month, okay? And let's say that we go around and we look at the other side of its orbit when it's far from the sun, from point three to point four, that is also gonna take a month, equal intervals of time. What Kepler is saying is that the reason we can say that those are equal intervals of time is because the shaded region that is um, labeled A and the shaded region that is uh, labeled B both are the same total area, like the same number of pixels on your screen. So equal areas in equal time. But area is not the same as physical distance in the orbit. If we were to imagine ourselves being this comet or spaceship or whatever we want to think about moving around the sun, we are going a very big distance from one to two and a very small distance along our orbit from three to four. In order to cover that distance, in the same amount of time, we are going very fast when we're near the sun, and we're going very slow when we're far from the sun. So that's what we wanna rephrase and add to our notes for Kepler's second law. Kepler's second law is also trying to tell us that a planet moves fastest when it is close to the sun, and it moves slowest when it is farther away. 
There's a simulator um, resource linked on the slide that I encourage you to check out where you can play around and see these equal areas in equal time. All right. Then Kepler's third law. The square of a planet's orbital period is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. That's very mathy again. That is, in words, a description of an equation, an equation that we don't really need to use for our specific purposes, not that much in this class, but we do want to recognize that that itself is a useful tool for astronomers. If we can track the orbital period of different planets, which we were able to do um, decades ago, uh, then we can figure out, based on this equation, how far away they would have to be. So Earth is highlighted here. It takes one year to go around the sun. And so we define a brand new unit in order for this to be a simple equation. We define a brand new unit in astronomical unit units, which is based on the semi-major axis of the Earth. That way, one squared can equal one cubed, and we've kind of set the standard that we compare all the other planets to. We can see that Mercury and Venus are closer to the Sun, and they take less time. And Mars and beyond are farther from the Sun, and they take more time to orbit. And the specific way that we get these numbers is by using p squared equals a cubed. You don't have to write the numbers down. You don't have to memorize them. I just want us to see for ourselves what this third law is trying to tell us. It's the way that these numbers are changing. Now, when Kepler set these laws up, he and the astronomy community knew about six total planets, Mercury through Saturn. So the real true relevance of these laws is that not only do they apply to the six objects that he was studying, but that as we discovered more planets, we were able to apply those laws to make sure we knew how they should be orbiting so we can track them around, and we'll see that more in the next video. And as we started to learn about other smaller objects, like comets and asteroids, they also follow these laws of motion. Now, Kepler was just looking for the underlying patterns in the math, and he didn't have an understanding of what was causing those patterns. It would take until Isaac Newton figuring out the universal law of gravitation, the subject of our next video, for us to have this full description of what is causing the motions that we see. So in that next video, we'll get to see what causes all of these laws to work. I'll see you in the next video.